So let's uh, let's get into this one. I'm um, you know I'm passionate about all the challenges that we face in uh, building SMEs, but I think that um, you know this is such an extraordinarily large topic. Um, I'm I'm uh, and uh, my discoveries in the three different companies I've been involved with have been every one of them has been so different in this particular area. So anyway, let me uh, let us uh, let us get into it. So. To begin, let's first of all uh, let's look at we've in this resilient business series where we did the introduction and then we're going to do uh, one episode on each of the four zones. And today's objective is to talk about the economic engine. The first thing to really uh, underscore is that with the other three zones, they're all what, what I call the foundations of business. So there, there is a lot more repeatability from one business to the next. So for instance, um, how your culture, how you recruit, um, how you engage people in healthy culture, how you manage finances and organizational design, uh, they all have some sort of uh, correlation from business to business. Whereas I think that the economic engine is the most uh, bespoke part of, of any business. So let's uh, pull apart. Well, I, I think this is a bit of a uh, duh sort of, <laughs> you know, question. I mean, how does... How does a focus on the economic engine contribute to resilient business? Well, the first thing before I get cranking on this one, I really want to make a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, I don't want to at any stage during this presentation sound like I'm a knower. Uh, I, I genuinely uh, am in this uh, in, in trying to help SME founders and leaders. Uh, I believe that this is an extraordinarily challenging and demanding area, um, uh, but obviously in the 30 years of business in entrepreneurship, I have actually learned a lot and, and there's really only one way to learn it and it's empirically. So it's a very, it's a very big topic. And as I've already stated, it's uh, unique to each, to each business. But I, I want to start with a story and that is that in 2016, we had our, for choir, we had our 20th year anniversary. As part of that, we invited our customers from you know, throughout that period. And what I was really, really uh, satisfied by was that we had people that had come to the, to the event we put on, which was a big party. And we had customers that were our foundation customers there and the companies that we founded uh, that began with the journey with us in 1996 were still with us. Now, some had gone because they were taken out by other companies, but the foundation customers were still with us 20 years on. Now, that's a story of sustainability and, and a mindset of saying, okay, how do, I, how do I build a business where I gain customers but really endeavor never to lose them. And I think that that, was, that that really was a burning driver for us that we really wanted to have a cumulative approach with our customers and not have that customer churn, which you know, I, I did speak a, a bit about that last week. Now, some of the, um, sorry, some of the uh, things I wanna get, or the topics, that I think are common issues for SMEs. And I'll just read some of these out. I'm not going to go into them in any detail, but throughout today's uh, talk, we'll be, we'll be pulling some of these apart. So the first is not solving a real problem or underserved need. The lack of focus because the founder gets excited by the next shiny thing. Opening up too many beachheads, i.e. market segments, that you can't resource. Having an offering, 
but it is not commercially viable. Developing an offering that is too bespoke. Not enough thinking about focus versus diversification. Not enough clarity on your differenti differentiation, your point of difference. And in the early stages, I think that often I see a lot of SME leaders, they conflate the concept of a co-creating customer with a customer. So these are just some of the things that through my journey, I, I've broken every one of those uh, eight things I just read out there in my journey. And I think that I see them uh, time and time and time again. And, th and when you actually look through each one of them, they are such difficult problems. So without, let's get into it then. So the first question I posted on LinkedIn before uh, I, I made a post about what can we learn as we go through this COVID period. So I think I called it learning in difficult times. And one of the questions I said, they said, do you have a customer risk problem? And the reason I brought this up is that I have been watching the boom and bust. Uh, I've been in the resources industry for most of my life, watch the boom and bust and then just see so many companies go broke uh, in a bust. And I think a lot of it's because there isn't a conscious, and this is where resilient business thinking is different, is that you're actually doing this sort of analysis. So there's different ratios, simple ratios, you know, the sum of your top five customers divided by your revenue, right? You know, your highest customer uh, and, and what the revenue you're receiving from them divided by total revenue. So if you look at uh, the, uh, there's a few glaring uh, examples going around at the moment. So the West Australian crayfish industry has over 90% of it's crayfish going to China. So if that particular market is, gets damaged in any way, or you've got a real problem. And I think that this is, so interestingly for Australia, this trade challenge we've got at the moment, 32% of our exports go to China. So this, just this uh, analysis of the uh, trying to, get some diversity in your customer base is a, is a super challenge. So in Acquire, we started off, we're pretty much at different times. We, if, if our customer caught a cold or said, sorry, we don't want your services anymore, it would have taken out our business. But what we started to, or would have put us into serious, serious, trouble in the early stages. But what we did was we put a lot of effort into the diversification of our customers. And not only, and, and I'll talk more and more about this, but we didn't only diversify, we diversified across the value chain, and then we diversified uh, into different commodities, and then we diversified into different geographies. And those three different levels of diversification gave us an extraordinarily robust uh, situation that reduced our customer risk. So, so I want to, when I'm doing this talk, I want to help, I want to give people some uh, materials and thinking to help them because this is what, these are things I developed or we developed uh, over time. Uh, and, and now it's definitely we developed in Adapt by Design. But when I was in Acquire, it was far more messy and I was just making up as I went along and I was trying to go out and determine how other people you know, tried to make sense of some of these challenges. So I want to just uh, help or just explain what this diagram says. So we have a, an offering on the x-axis there and the offering is what we're taking to the world to solve a particular problem or underserved need. And then we have different markets, market segments. And one of the things that we've, we've recognized is that quite a few people are, uh, they, they're trying to uh, 
uh, they haven't consolidated in a current market with a current offering. And the, especially it's a classic sort of entrepreneurial thing to say, oh yeah, but there's this wonderful opportunity over here. And it's in a, it's in a different geography with a different offering in a different, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a different segment. And so if you look at that, you can see that if I have the same offering and I'm taking out exactly the same offering, but I'm just changing the market, that, that is, that's probably a uh, lower risk than having to change your whole offering uh, for, for a market. But it, it, it's, 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 it's too difficult because this is the problem of the bespoke part. It's too difficult to actually determine that until you get into the detail. But one thing we can say for sure, if, we're, if we have a new market or new uh, offering uh, situation, we, that is at the most complex. And I think that this is a real area of risk for uh, companies, for SMEs, because they've got to walk before they can run. And so this, this idea of balancing, you know, focus and diversification becomes a, a major challenge. But I think that this, this approach also helps us inform the, uh, explore the customer risk problem. So, so this, this um, pull, because I think that there, this is one of those polarity problems. So I, I think it's a massive conundrum. And I don't think I've ever come across a company that isn't perpetually uh, got this conundrum in some, some uh, way. You know, they've, they've discovered and made, there is a new opportunity, right? And they, they really want to go and explore it, but they don't have the resourcing in place in their current offering. So is, it, is the strategy better to uh, consolidate and focus on the current offering so that they can differentiate. So let me, let me just give you a, a story, a quick story about Acquire. So in Acquire, we made the decision that we, we were going to be a geoscientific information management uh, company in the mining value chain. That was, that was it. So it was geoscientific information management. And we had a plethora of information management and data science opportunities outside that. But we ended up becoming the largest supplier in hard rock information management geoscience in the world in our niche. The reason we did that is because of focus. Now, this doesn't mean Bill Withers was the focused one. <laughs> I was surrounded by wonderful people and together we would, we would work out together how to do, when it's right to do the market diversity, uh, diversification when it was right to focus. And it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a super challenging problem. So moving through this, and that's why I say that, see that intersection there, it's just not as clean as that. Um, sometimes you've got a bias to market diversity and you're under-resourced, your development and your product team, you're under-resourced, you, you don't know enough about the market, uh, everybody's pushed, uh, and you could, at that particular instance, not be delivering to your existing customers as well as you should. That's the, the grand challenge with this. Market diversity, focus. So anyway, that's, uh, that's a, a grand conundrum. But all of these, uh, the, the purpose of this presentation from uh, my perspective is, is to raise the conundrums, but also just share a, some um, tools and ways and means by which uh, I tried to solve these problems. The other thing that I'd like to do is just, uh, Roma, for you, I, I, I think that, and I'm, this is very emergent, uh, I think that we should do the Q&A and have a larger Q&A at the end because I believe that all of the three questions 
are interrelated and all of the content for the three questions are interrelated. So if you're cool with that, I, I'll just keep going with, with this. Okay, so, okay, let's, let's get into it. Okay, so I'm going to tell my own story about, uh, you know, the, the diversification challenge in the customer and, and, uh, and, and I'm going to, well, first I'll read out the question. How critical is your offering to customers when their financial security is under stress? So in this, the story goes that we came out of the blocks and we were building an, a system that had its bias to greenfields exploration and early stage resource development. And the, in actual fact, our first sale wasn't even in Australia. In 1999, we went to Main Street, Johannesburg, and we made the sale to uh, Anglo-American Exploration. That's, I don't have time for that story, but it was a hell of a story. And we made the call and we had no office in, in Africa at all. And they said, yep, we're happy to deploy our very young system across Africa. So, so we, that's where we really got our big break. Now, doing that, the, the grand challenge that we started to realize pretty early on actually, is that when they're under financial pressure, that's the exploration departments within mining companies. When, when the mining companies and the resource companies are under pressure, the R&D part of their business, which is exploration, gets clipped, right? Which means that we, uh, our revenue would also get clipped. And so we thought, well, we don't want to give up the support for our customers in, in Greenfield's exploration, but we need to do something with some urgency to be able to, when we, when we have a uh, commodities pricing uh, bust, we need to be able to uh, support the organization through those times. So what, what we dis decided was that our system was very good at, at in the ore control or grey control part of an operating mine. And what mining companies rarely do, very rarely do, is close even when the commodity prices are under serious, uh, you know, they're really low. They rarely shut mining down. So what we called that was uh, sticky. We wanted to be stickier. So we came up with two different strategies there. We let the, ex when they did shut the expiration companies down, we allowed them to put our technology into stasis so that we had a way for them to turn it back on with speed. But we also were in the operating mine. So we'd done the diversification across the value stream to actually make sure that when they're under financial pressure, we are still in business. And it was a, it was huge. It was a hugely successful thing. We ended up at 500 mines around the world, and it was, it was critical. I, I can tell you to this day. Now, I don't have time to to go through all of the uh, all of the different situations. But one thing that we did um, learn was that by our geographic diver diversification and our spread into North America and South America into different areas that tend to have a bias toward different commodities, that also worked very well to, to help us with uh, our financial security when they were under stress. So that's, let me keep going here then. So I, I want to, I want to just share, and, and this is the part where I want to share some information to everybody about how we break this down. Now, in that previous picture, I was talking about, you know, the different, the different sectors here. So we've got 
our offering, which is made up of our products and services, the business model, and the flow of the key functions, you know, engage the market, sell to the customer, deliver our offering, and support their customer. Typical sort of flow of key functions. So, and, and, and I, I just wanted to make this point that I think that um, uh, the, to, to do the analysis of the criticality of your offering to them, it's what, what I'm sharing here is, is it just a little bit about method for how you can try and determine that. And we break, I think that, you know, there's lots and lots and lots out there uh, in this particular area. I appreciate that. It's just, this is how we made sense of it and how we've uh, cut the problem up. So the, and the, the common thing that I see when I'm talking to startups uh, is that they often haven't considered that their offering is not just the product. It is everything so that the, cut, so that the product is running successfully with inside the customer's position. So anyway, that's the offering side. Now I wanna just talk about markets and market uh, segmentation. So it's, it's, it's a simple process to do really, to actually say, okay, well, what industries are we in? What sort of size of company? So to give you some idea of that for acquire, we were, we knew that we were in uh, the majority of uh, industrial minerals, mineral sands, uh, we were in gold, we were across. So, so we knew which commodities we were in. And then we, but what was really, really telling was size. So we had four different divisions for breaking up the market. We had super majors, majors, mid tiers and juniors. And we were not a company that had an offering for juniors. So we did not sell into, well, uh, there's another story about how we tried, but that was never successful. So the, the, the mid tiers through to the super majors were our, were, were our size. And so I'm not gonna keep, keep going with that and I don't have time for it today, but it's just to say, okay, if I'm gonna truly understand my customer, I need to get to this point where I start to really get into, and, and I think sometimes with archetypes and personas, I think that a lot of the materials I've read and what people are doing there, sometimes it's a little too superficial. Um, and I think that personas come after we do customer roles. So do the segmentation, and then you've got the customer roles in those segments, and then you've got the customer stories for those segments, and then you can go to personas and, and archetypes. So that's, that's the, the sort of, uh, you know, um, how we slice and dice it to truly understand the underserved needs that we're solving. But the underserved needs are not only for the problem, say, say in our case, geoscientific information management and some problem that a geologist in the ore control process has. Our problem is also to understand the commercial reality and the commercial ramifications for, uh, you know, the challenges that the chief geologist or the mine manager might have in procuring that particular solution. So let's, uh, let's keep going. So well, one of the things, and, and we'll um, send some additional, I'm happy to send some additional materials out um, after this. I don't want to put any pressure. Renee's on the call. Renee, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I know you're under the pump. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, the uh, customer, th this is just a template for how to code a customer role. And this is, uh, the idea is to say for us, we had the users, so we'd have a geologist, planning engineer, we'd have the first line of commercial decision maker, the mine manager, say, second line of commercial decision maker would be procurement. And then we would have somebody from IT 
to do the analysis of the technology integrity, right? So there would be four different customer roles we'd often be, um, be uh, th that we would have to convince if they're going to take our offering. And so the, the customer, we would think through this concept so that we would have a hypothesis as to what our customer story was, and then we would validate and continuously validate our customer story. Later on, I'm going to talk, uh, well, in the next slide, actually, I'm gonna talk about the inference ladder. And the reason I'm going to bring in the inference ladder is because I feel it's essential for uh, helping really be brutally honest with yourself and make sure you don't delude yourself about what, what the customer's actual situation is. So not only the problem, but also how are they going to be able to purchase your offering and you know, how does that relate to your business model? So that this is what I think is the, the nub of it all is that we really want to make sure that we're not only solving the problem, we're also capturing customer stories to make sure that our, cut, our business model is gonna be truly valid and sustainable in, in, their, in their world. So let's move on then. Um, I, I, I share this because I feel that the ladder of inference is one of the um, best things I was ever taught. <laughs> um, I, uh, I have been a, uh, as, I have definitely been a person that deluded myself at different times in my entrepreneurial journey. And I told myself stories I wanted to hear, not what was the actual reality and what the evidence was portraying. And so what the inference ladder or the ladder of inference, if you go, it's, I think it was originally founded by a Harvard professor or somebody, but it's brilliant. And it, it really helps you challenge yourself because there's a real challenge that often see in this bit here i select data this is the danger so i can I, I, i've got to be really really so so all of us when we're capturing the feedback from the customer and observing their behaviors we've got to actually be really really clear about how are we getting real data or am I, do I have an unconscious bias that, that is actually selecting data that reinforces my own position? So this uh, is, I, th I think this is the biggest, one of the biggest challenges to most founding entrepreneurs because they, and, and why some just go bust is because they, they really haven't been brutally honest with themselves and really gone for the data. And, and I just want to say, I just want to make it really, really clear that I, um, I, I have been as bad as anybody at this at different times. It's just that I, I eventually, you know, I was surrounded by people and, you know, some customer grabbed me by the scruff and said, no, no, mate, this is the way it is or whatever. So I think that's just uh, a tip that I, I strongly, strongly recommend. So, okay, this part, could, could you design your commercial model so that your revenue is both recurring and more forecastable? Now, I, I help a lot of people in service businesses now as well as um, technology businesses. But I think that business model analysis and business model design is actually one of the biggest things in, 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 in building a successful SME because I began my journey uh, in 1984. I came out and I was a software engineer, but I was still working in a consulting company. So I learned a lot about being in a service only business. And, you know, it, it really was a very brutal sort of business model because I, the only way that we could, you know, get a return was by the hour that we executed. And so it really, I think it was pretty early on that I started to ask questions. Well, even in a service company, could we have, could we have some sort of annuity with 
uh, you know, and, and get try and work out some way of getting a recurring uh, income. And now, what, what I did notice though was when we went from the consulting company to build Acquire, and in Acquire we had three different forms of income. We had license income, which was capital, a big uh, sale, and then we had maintenance which was 20% of the sale price and then we had services. And so wh what, what I started to realize is not only did we get a better recurring, um, a recurring model, and now I know that maintenance has been sort of replaced a lot by subscription thinking and, and more SaaS models, but the, 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 the beauty of that was that we actually had something that was a large capital item that uh, of income and then we had the maintenance so if we made a sale this year next year's maintenance was 20 percent higher and then the license sale drove the services so it was just a really interesting thing now i think that that this again is a is an extraordinary difficult area but by going back and looking at the customer behavior, we started to realize that one of the problems with our license model is that CFOs don't like um, capital purchases and that it would be better that everything was in operating costs. So that was one behavior we, we noticed. And so, so we started to say, okay, how can we, um, and that's why I think subscriptions are doing better than the license maintenance model now. Well, I, I haven't done that analysis, but I think they are doing better. I think in expiration, I, I just want to note that we, we made a, did a customer behavior analysis and really looked at, they really didn't like their high fixed costs. So what they wanted to do because of the boom bust problem, they wanted to lower their fixed costs, but were happy to have, you know, higher variable costs in a boom. So anyway, that was another thing that we uh, started designing an offering for. So um, given the timer at 11.41, no, I think we are on time here to, uh, I will just share a side story here and, and this doesn't relate totally to question three, but I did, while I was doing this slide, I thought it was important to share that um, getting paid is, is another thing that relates. I mean, obviously, the, a lot of people in business think that at the point they made the sale, uh, that's where it ends, whereas the financial people in my business made it very, very clear, Bill, to me, and they'd say, well, Bill, it's all well and good, but this business uh, requires the, uh, the funds to actually hit our bank account. And to that end, we put in a whole of company process and really looked at, this was in the acquired days, and we looked at um, that our average debtor payment days was 75 days. So, the, and, and you know, that's not unusual in the resources industry. So what we did with, um, the, we actually did a customer behavior analysis on how they, how they pay us. And we started to understand their payment cycle and when their check run worked. And so we would actually invoice in a different way. And then we actually had some processes within our financial teams to actually uh, you know, go and connect to them so that we could get it in the check run. So we got from 75 days down to 42 days. It was, I didn't run that project. Um, others did it and it was, it was magnificent the way they did it. It was uh, a really, but you can imagine what that means from a cash flow position, especially as we were, you know, getting into the, uh, you know, over a couple of million per month or, you know, up around the uh, million and a half to two million per month sort of area. Okay, so let's um, keep going then. So the, the, the point I really want to make here is that um, the, to, to do this work is, is hard because we're trying to actually get a sustainable and resilient revenue stream designed, but 
we need to deal with this polarity again. We've got the customer needs and our needs, right? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you soon, I'm gonna show you something called the trust equation. Uh, but but what, what, I, what I wanna say here is that designing business models that actually um, can, uh, you know, really uh, solve and, and get in that um, good solution area is challenging. And I'll just share a quick story with you. Um, with the DAP by design, we wanted to build a model that indexed the, our, our offering with our customers a function of the size of the SME we were working with. So imagine, you know, we didn't think it was fair that somebody that's got 15 people and, you know, uh, two million turnover is, is paying the same that somebody is, uh, you know, got 50 people and 10 million turnover. So we said, okay, well, let's just index it as a percentage of payroll. Yeah. Now, this is a funny story because one of my greatest, the only taxation in my life that I really get animated about is payroll tax. And uh, that's another story because I can really froth over that one. And, uh, but I think that the funny thing here was that I had designed a business model that was a payroll tax. So uh, we got rid of that. But uh, I just thought I'd share that story to how, how difficult it is to do. So I, I'm going to finish off here with uh, a, um, uh, a, it'll just take me five minutes or so just to pull this apart because this, this equation, uh, it, look, it came out of a book, I believe called The Trusted Advisor. I'm sorry, I, I will get that reference if you want it, but the, the equation is really very self-explanatory. And it, it, I didn't have this when I was in Acquire, but it certainly informed things while I've been in Adapt. But I think I was doing it surreptitiously in, in Acquire. You know, I was, it, it sort of, it, it makes sense. So just to pull it apart, so you've got credibility, you know, as it says there, they know their stuff. So let's imagine that we've got our SME company and we, we are trying to engage a new customer. So we've got to have credibility. Then we, we want reliability. So reliability means it works. The offering we deliver to them is going to work. The, the next one's really interesting because, you know, intimacy is, is an essential part of a successful, uh, in my experience, this is the one where there's certain service providers, you know, that I, I've worked with. I'm not going to name them here, but they, are, they, get a, they get 8 out of 10 for C and they get 8 out of 10 for R, but they their eye was really low. And unfortunately, the one that I'm going to talk about now, um, S, which is self-orientation, was very, very large. So as you can see in this um, equation, if, if your S is very, very large, you have low trust. And I feel that that's why uh, uh, this the trust equation informs this very well because you, you, want to, you want to build your offering and you want to have a commercial model that, and, and a full offering that actually says it will be, uh, we have credibility, it will be reliable, we will maintain the relationship with our customer so that we can hear and get feedback and make sure that everything, at, but when we, when we design our business model, it won't be biased by self-orientation. We've got to get that. However, we've got to sustain. So, so that building sustainable business models and to empower a resilient business is a really nuanced area. And uh, I think uh, with that, I'll close it out and uh, open it up for questions.